programmers, testers, documentarians, designers, managers, attendees, speakers, organizers, did I leave anyone out, videographers. <laughs> uh, welcome to the final uh, pre-unconference day of Open Source Bridge. This is my favorite time slot to have. It's right after the keynote, so I get to enjoy the rest of my day instead of dreading it. Uh, if I seem a little loopy, I have not had much sleep, so I'm just going to use that and work with it. Uh, discovered today, that's a great uh, remedy for the butterflies in the stomach, is it's just to be too exhausted to feel them anymore. So this talk, uh, you got your Idris in my C++, uh, a first look at denotational design. Uh, I'll be giving a version of it in October. I'm going to tell people it's about maintenance, but really it's about fun. Uh, it's about bringing fun to work, and I, I don't mean just having that precious indie rock band come and, and, and play in your, your company break room. Right. I, I just actually mean making our, our, our workplace, if there were a way to kind of press a button and get a little more fun injected into our daily work, I would like to do that. Not that our jobs aren't fun, but there are, are things that could be even funnerer about them. So the, pro the problem I'm posing today is this. We have these programs that, uh, programming languages that we're paid uh, to work in, C and C++ and Java. And we have these really fun ones that we'd like to work in, like Ruby and, and Elixir and Clojure and Haskell. And, your lists are different than these. That's OK. In fact, you know, maybe, maybe for some of you, Ruby's on the, on the boring list. Or, or maybe you, you work at New Relic, and, and you just have one list, and the, the languages you get to work in are the same as the ones that you get paid to work in. Or Haskell's on both lists. Right. <laughs> or Haskell's on both lists. And maybe some of you are sad that Node's not on either list. That's OK, too. Yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and if you do work at New Relic, are you hiring? Anyway. <laughs> So what can we do about this situation to, to make it a little better? Uh, so when I'm, when I'm asking that question, what I really mean is how can we sneak the fun languages into work a little bit? So I'll give one example. Uh, this is the, a pretty rare case. But the, the Greenfield project, right? The, that rare case when you have zero lines of code written, you've got some small to medium sized project. And if you can sell uh, your pet technology to the team, well, maybe, maybe you, can, you can use it. Uh, there are more reliable ways to do this. Has anyone in the room had success at bringing a, a, a more fun or a more rigorous, more expressive language into their? OK, Ed, how'd, how'd you do it? Uh, I, I started with Perl and, uh, and then went up to R, basically. Perl to R. And, and so, and you, but how'd you, how'd you sneak R in, into uh, the front I, door? Oh, OK, so you've got to write it in Perl, and Perl just shells out to R to do the real work. Nice. It, it had, how'd you get it in? Uh, it, it was essentially true of product, if you will. Let's use this open source product, and then you know, we had it. Now we would have that language for the product that you're building to get oh, the and Nice. So bring in an off-the-shelf product that happens to be built on yeah, a good uh, open source. Excellent. Um, so I've, I've also seen things like, oh, well, I've, I've got this prototype. Um, I, we're going to throw it away anyway, so let's just do it in you know, pet language X. Or uh, if it's maybe just a small a little script to munge some data, or a little web server to serve up some local engineering data, and anything like that. There's also the whole like, continuing education thing. Like You've got to do something while your program's compiling. So now's the time to bust out that Elixir book and, and start cranking through a few examples. Um, another way to do it is by stealth. And a lot of shops had success with this with JRuby, where their, their customer is running the JVM, they, they just want a jar file. So the, the Ruby shop writes it in Ruby and packages it up in a jar file and sends it to them. And the customer never even noticed the difference, except for it works a lot better, but launches a lot slower. <laughs> so we're going to talk about one more way to sneak fun into our workplace today. And, and that is something called denotational design. And uh, the term comes from, near as I can tell, from, from Connell Elliott, who said, uh, when designing software, in addition to innovating in your implementations, relate them to precise and familiar semantic models. And I really want to zoom in on those last few words, precise and familiar semantic models. Uh, so we, we want to model what our program is supposed to do, but in an unambiguous way, not, not just to draw it on the whiteboard what it's supposed to do, but actually write it down in, in some perhaps even machine executable way, at the very least some way that, that a mathematician might recognize. So in other words, um, Elliot is telling us to sketch out our design in clear notation that, that spells out what our program is supposed to do. And then go implement it in the real world. 
Now, in, in his paper, he was actually using Haskell for both his before and after language. It was just like you design it in pretty Haskell and then you implement it in performant Haskell. That's sort of the, the way he was going. But it, his idea was that if you start down in the nuts and bolts of performance, and then you, you'll, you'll never end up with a usable API, or at least not as often. So what kind of clear notation are we talking about? So uh, he was saying math. <laughs> like, let's, let's model our program. Let's write it out as if we're a, a math proof or, or some sufficiently mathy programming language. And that is the segue for me to bring in Idris. So Idris is a cousin of the programming language, Haskell. Uh, it's written in Haskell. Its syntax looks a lot like Haskell. Haskell programmers will be equally at home. Non-Haskell programmers like me will be equally befuddled, but that's OK. So I'll show just a couple of lines of, of code so we can see what it looks like. If we just wanted to write a function that takes a number and doubles it, uh, it would look like this. However, the Idris type system has a lot more fanciness uh, in it. And so Idris actually needs you to go ahead and give the type signature of the function as well. So this is a function twice that takes an integer, returns an integer, and then here's the body of the function. And then you can just call it. Um, Idris has, you can, you can compile your program and then just run it, or you can you know, use the read eval print loop, the REPL, and you know, interact with Idris. And that becomes really key when we're coming uh, around to proofs later on. So Idris is like Haskell, but Idris has uh, dependent types. There's a lot that comes along with that. One of the simplest things that comes along with that is that types are first class citizens. It's just like when, when you're in C++ and you can't really do anything with classes and you go to, to Ruby or Smalltalk and suddenly like, wow, I can spin up a class at runtime and manipulate it. You get that same kind of joy in, in Idris and getting to manipulate types. You could write functions that take types as inputs. You could write a function called isNumeric and you pass in, the name. You, don't t you don't pass in a value called 42 or hello, you pass in the actual like type name integer and, and you can use this function of the REPL and, and, and try it out. So another thing that comes along with dependent typing is that types can depend on values. So in, in Haskell, types can depend on other types. Uh, you could say, I've, I've got this idea of a list of x's, where x is a Boolean or a string or a number or whatever. I can have a list of all numbers or, or a list of all Booleans. So that list type depends on the type of the thing you're putting in the list. But in Idris, they can also depend on values. So let's, let's look at an example of that. Uh, here is a, a Haskellish example with no uh, types depending on values in it. We'll, we'll add that in a minute. Um, this is ripped straight out of the, uh, the Idris standard library and then the, the, the name changed slightly and then uh, the good stuff taken out of it so I can add it back in. Well, we're gonna define a, a new data type. That's uh, the, the data keyword is for. Uh, it's gonna be a vector type so it's going to wrap up some type like bool or int or string into another type vector of bools or vector of ints or vector of strings. And so there are two ways to build a vector. You can build an empty one or you can build a vector by sticking a, a new a, where, where a is the type you're adding in, onto an existing vector and you get a new vector with the new item in it. And it's kind of cool because you read it like this, you realize, oh yeah, we think of this as a data type, but it also kind of looks like a function that takes a type and returns a type. So if we wanted to actually use this, we could say, okay, take nil and then stick true on the front of that and then stick false on the front of that. There's more than one nil in the language and if you just say nil here, the type checker will say, well, which one do you mean? So you, you pass in this little bit of, of magic here. It looks like syntax, right? It looks like, oh, this is special syntax to sort of decorate this value with a type. But the cool thing about the type system is in Idris is it's strong enough. Um, this is just a plain old function in Idris called the. However, it has the least Googleable name of any <laughs> function. Like, how, I, I, I was looking forever just to try to find out what is this thing. I, I didn't know if it was a keyword or a function or what. I, I eventually just like cloned the entire source tree and started looking. And even the source tree, of course, has lots of those in it and the comments and things. So, yes, exactly. Uh, or right. Or yeah, I'm I'm sure R is tougher. Yeah. Or, or does anybody remember C sharp before the search engines all got wise to the to the pound sign? I remember C plus <laughs> Yes, it's C plus plus. Yeah. So lo lots of fun there. But it's just a plain old function, and that was a little moment of delight when I found it. I'm like, oh wow, it's just the standard library thing. 
And uh, the REPL is smart enough to recognize this thing you're building looks like a collection, and it actually kind of pretty prints the response for you. Um, anyway, the, the nearest equivalent in C++, which is the language that I spend a lot of my days in, uh, would look something like this, right? You, you can have things that depend on types. They're not quite functions in the sense they're not running at runtime. They're kind of function-ish, right? But you have templates. You can say, okay, I've got this vector class. It could be a vector of strings or a vector of ints or whatever. And uh, I've got a nil, or I've got the ability to insert a new thing into a vector and give me a new vector. So now let's hop back to Idris, and this time we're going to add in types depending on values. So now our, our vector type isn't just a, a vector of strings, it's a vector of some number of strings, some k strings. It's built into the type. A vector of five strings is different, a different type than a vector of four str strings. So now nil is specifically a zero length vector. Z is Idris speak for the natural number zero. And then the addition operator takes a vector of k length and returns a vector of k plus one length. And s is the successor function. It's the plus one operator in, in Idris. We'll take a look at that in just a second. So in, in C++, it actually looks kind of like this. I'm shocked that this actually compiled. I was going to come up here and put this on a slide and say, like, and you can't do this in C++ because but it actually this compiles just fine. So like a, a vector of k plus one uh, items is a distinct type from a vector of k items. This is not a super way, a super efficient way to design a class in C++, but the point is that there's, C++ 11 is especially is now like in, finally an interesting enough programming language that you can kind of do some cool stuff back and forth, and that, that's part of why um, I'm looking into this subject is now we have a real programming language almost. Do languages like Cypress copy the code for every language? Um, yes, yes you do. So yeah, it's not, it's not super efficient. <laughs> <laughs> right. Again, I'm not recommending this as a great way to, to implement uh, vectors. So, uh, by the way, um, this whole like zero and successor type thing, um, this is the way that uh, Idris represents natural numbers. And there's a, there's a nat type built in that has a you know a z and an s. Uh, and so these are the, you know, the the notion of uh, panda numbers, right? Where you've got zero and um, you've got the successor to zero is is one. And then the successor to the successor of zero is, is two, and so on and so forth. And then the REPL sort of, again, pretty prints that for you. So you can, you can type in an integer literal, and, and the REPL will, behind the scenes, expand that out. So I, I, that kind of tickles me a little bit to think that 42 in Idris is syntactic sugar uh, for this. <laughs> yeah, syntactic poison, yes. <laughs> So this allows you to do cool things, like you can write uh, an add function that concatenates two vectors together. It concatenates a vector of n to a vector of m and gives you back a vector of n plus m. And one of the cool things about this is if, if you, heaven forbid, make a mistake during your implementation, Idris will actually catch this at compile time and say, I can't prove that your function always returns the vector of the correct length. And so when we actually fill in our implementation, adding two vectors together or one of them is nil, uh, just gives you the other vector. Otherwise, adding a vector that has at least one item, you just take that one item and stick it to the result of adding the rest of the vectors together. And again, this passes the type checker, and therefore, it'll probably work. So the upshot of all this is that you know, in a typical language, we think about doing operations, and I'll just use the word math because it's got fewer syllables. We think about doing math on values, right? We're going to take these classes and call some methods on them and pass them into some other functions and move the data around. We're doing math on data. But in Idris, you can do math on meaning. And, and that's really what these papers on denotational design that I only sort of half understand <laughs> get, get deeply into. And we, another thing that comes to mind when we talk about doing math on meaning is, is proofs. Proof is kind of like doing math on meaning. You, you, you start with a proposition, or you start with some axioms and, and, and a set of allowable transformations, teeny tiny transformations, just like you did in geometry class or trig class, where you're only allowed to transform your expression a tiny bit at a time, otherwise you'll get an F. <laughs> and um, 
math is unambiguous enough to kind of do that. And in Idris, you can actually encode those same types of transformations and, and actually get proofs of certain properties of your, of your program expressed as uh, facts in the type system, if you will. So let's say we're gonna write an add function if Idris didn't already have one. We're gonna add together two natural numbers and that will return a natural number. So if we add zero to anything, that's just the same number. Otherwise, if we add one more than a number to another number, that's just one more than the recursive case. And you all have seen recursive function definitions like this. They're very cute. So let's say this was our implementation and we wanted to make sure that x plus y and y plus x are the same. We wanted to check the commutative property. So in a, in a, in a different programming language, what are some ways we might do that? Unit test, yes. Right, we, we might spin up some code and say, all right, let's try three plus two and two plus three. In Haskell, we might use something like quick check to kind of generate a bunch of test cases for us. But uh, we're not exhaustively checking every possible natural number. We'd, we'd be there for a while, I, I understand. <laughs> but not as long as that poor guy over there trying to do it for all the real numbers. <laughs> um, so. Proofs, right? If we wanted to prove that our implementation was commutative rather than just testing it, we now get into the field of Wilder propositions. It's type's idea that, that there's this correspondence between proofs and programs. And that's kind of what I was hinting at a minute ago with uh, we, we can express facts about our program as steps in a proof. So let's write a program that kind of proves that our, our implementation of addition is commutative. So in other words, we want to prove that given two natural numbers, x and y, x plus y and y plus x are equal. This is a plain old function in Idris. It's a program. This proof is a program. This is the type of the function. The type uh, takes an assertion and an assertion and returns uh, a, a proposition, if you will. This is the type of this function. And then now we have to get it past the type checker. So um, are y'all familiar with proof by induction? Yes. All righty, so uh, quick review, right? You gotta prove that the thing you're trying to prove is true for zero, like if we're doing natural numbers, right? It's true for zero, and then you, you prove that if it's true for x, then it's also true for x plus one. And if you can prove both of these things, then you have successfully proven your proposition true for all natural numbers. Is everyone convinced of this? Okay, excellent. Because I haven't seen the proof of that this works since like, I don't know, in 20 years or something like that. So I don't, I don't think I could regurgitate it today. Oh, were, were you saying something about inductive reasoning? I, yeah, I, I love proof by induction. It's the best kind of induction. Exactly. Oh yes, Pro proof by induction is the best kind, yes. <laughs> I, I love it because it's, it feels like a trick. It feels like you get away with something, right? So uh, all we have to do is, is fill in the body of, of this function for the different cases, and, and Idris has sort of pattern matching like Haskell. So let's express the base case uh, in Haskell. So we, we know we need to have a, a case for add commutes for zero and some number y. We don't need to worry about what goes in there yet, so we're gonna leave a, a hole, and we do that by putting a question mark. That's, that's a to-do. That's an XXX in our code that we can grab for later. Right? And we'll never ever check that in, right? And then we have the, the induction case, which says, okay, if we're doing you know, some non-zero number, we are allowed to hypothesize that the previous case worked, and now we just have to, to prove that it works for the, for the successor. And again, we put in a question mark here. Now, if, uh, if you're using one of the main uh, Unix-y text editors, Vim, Emacs, Sublime, uh, there are plugins for Idris that will let you put the cursor over this and actually start letting Idris guess at implementations because some of the trivial ones, it can fill in for you. It's, it's kind of neat. It seems like magic. It's like, whoa, you just wrote my proof for me. But even if we have to do it all by hand, it's not so bad. So, Wait, the yes, that, that's true, yeah, it, it'll, that's a good point. Idris can also, it, it's not limited to proofs. You can auto-complete implementations of, of functions in, uh, in Idris, in, the, in uh, your text editor. So from the command prompt, we load up our, our program in Idris, and we type m 
for missing. That's what I think of it as anyway. And it says, okay, you haven't yet defined your base case or your inductive step. Okay, so other than the entire proof, we're all done. <laughs> so we're gonna start proving the base case is the easy one. So we'll say, okay, colon P, base. And Idris comes out with all these goals and assertions and things like that, but uh, basically this is the thing we're supposed to prove, that given Y is natural, then this is true. So then we do this bit of rhetorical trickery, say, well, I know why it's gonna be natural because nobody, nobody's gonna be able to call my function with any other kind of value. It's right there in the type signature. We're allowed to assume this part. So we can, we can actually get this out of our proof. So we, we do this with a command uh, intros. And that says, okay, we're allowed to assume that Y is natural. We don't, have to, we don't have to prove that. So now we have a new goal to prove, which is just that Y equals Y plus zero. Okay, so this seems pretty easy to prove. It seems like a fundamental property of addition. It's pretty much how addition is defined in the standard library. So we should be able to grub through the standard library and, and, and find an axiom that, that sort of this is self-evidently true. And in fact, there is an axiom, if you go look at, at the Idris Lang repo on GitHub, you go poking around in the prelude and go to the natural number section, you will find this unfortunately named plus, uh, plus zero right neutral but the type of this function is, given that left is a natural number, that left plus zero equals left. This is exactly what we wanna prove. We wanna prove that y equals y plus zero, and this is, well, it's y plus zero equals y, close enough. So we wanna rewrite one of the terms in our expression, we wanna rewrite y to be y plus zero. So we say, okay, rewrite using this plus zero right neutral. And Idris does the substitution. This used to just say y, right? And now it says y plus zero. And this is the new thing we have to prove. This seems even easier to prove. In <laughs> fact, it seems uh, trivial to prove. In fact, we just type in trivial. And Idris goes, oh yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> I, love, I love typing this in. It's like, yes. And then you get to type in QED. And, and Idris prints out the proof that you just wrote. And the cool thing about this is if you're doing this interactively, you can backtrack. I, I made mistakes while I was preparing the slides for this, and you can you hit colon Q, and it just dumps you out of the proof, and you're back at the, the list of you know, missing, uh, missing propositions. You can take this proof then and paste it into your source code. So now you have a proof that your uh, base case works uh, for every possible integer, and it runs every time you compile your program. You change your addition implementation, the compiler will proof check. So this is like even cooler than unit test case. So that's the base case, and now we wanna move on to the inductive step. So we go back to our list and we say, okay, what's missing now? Like, well, just the inductive step. We say, okay, let's start proving it. And again, we get the, the, the thing that we're supposed to prove. We have three assertions now. We have given that X and Y are natural numbers, but here's our induction hypothesis, right? We, we are allowed to assume that x plus y is y plus x, and we just have to prove the successor uh, case. This bit here, this is the, this is the part that, that it's up to us to prove. And uh, so x plus y plus one is the same as y plus x plus one. So Idris has, has managed to get as far as it could, and it says, okay, this, this is where I have to stop. So again, we say intros, which allows us to say, yes, we can assume that X and Y are always natural numbers. We, we can assume the induction hypothesis. And again, here's the bit we have to prove here. There's a lot of chat right here in the middle. I don't, you know, anyway, but this is the important part. Again, looking at the prelude, trying to prove that, uh, trying to pr prove that this plus one can sort of bubble inside the parentheses, it, it, it seems like there would be an axiom for that. And there is. In fact, the implementation's in here too. So if you, if you wanna see, um, it's, it's not hard to write it by hand either, but if you wanna see what their implementation looks like, you can actually poke around and, and see all their proofs for natural numbers. So this, this one uh, says just what we want. It says that you can bubble the successor right inside the expression. So we say rewrite, and again, we, we pass in this unfortunately name, plus successor, write successor and it does that substitution. So now we end up with successor of plus xy and successor of plus yx. 
as the thing that we have to prove. Um, can anybody identify an axiom that we could use to prove that these two are the same? The induction hypothesis, yes. I think, Ed, you were first. So here's a copy of a book that has some stuff about interest in it. <laughs> so um, I'll hold it up in front of the camera so yeah. I can. I can. <laughs> OK. Uh, this is seven, lang seven more languages in seven weeks. Uh, Bruce Tate got together uh, a gang of authors. And we, together we wrote about uh, Elm and Factor and uh, Julia and Minnie Conran and Lua and Idris and one other unforgettable language. So. <laughs> So there's an interest chapter in there, and there's a, there's a lot of other cool stuff. There's a talk uh, at this conference on Julia. There's a yeah. chapter in the book on Julia. Was, did anybody go to that? Was no, it good? I okay, I, I, I missed it, but I'll, I'll, I want to catch it on video when it comes out. So uh, it was like on data visualization, or? Yeah. Nice. Elixir was the other language. Yes. Oh, Elixir, yes, yes. Um, so yes, Ed, and, and who's the other? Brian, you identified it too? So I heard a voice on this side of the room. So yes, we can use the induction hypothesis, which is plus xy equals plus yx, to prove exactly this. So we say rewrite hypothesis. And it just makes a substitution for us. And now we have to prove the successor of x plus y is the successor of x plus y. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Trivial. And we are done. And so here's our proof of the inductive case. We put this in our source code file. And again, Idris will prove our code correct, well, at least correct for uh, commutivity, uh, every time we modify our implementation of addition. And if, if we make a mistake and violate that property, or at least don't implement it in a way that Idris can verify that it's true, then that it won't pass the type checker. So when I see this kind of stuff, <laughs> this is sort of my reaction. <laughs> I love this. I, I, I have to use this in every talk. <laughs> so this is from uh, Tim and Eric Awesome Show, Great Job. And, it, if, yes. and if you Google for Tim and Eric uh, Cosmos or Tim and Eric uh, Mind Blown, they do a lot of these talking head uh, Cosmos style interviews with the camera, but they quickly ramble on and become incoherent, much like I'm doing now. <laughs> So we just went like way into the deep end here with all these sort of proofs about our code. Uh, I want to kind of zoom back out here and say, well, how can we actually apply all this stuff? Um, I don't have ways to apply this really deep proof stuff into my daily C++ code, but I do have some ways to apply the lighter dependent type stuff that I'd like to talk about now. So really, uh, we're just kind of dipping our toes in here. The waters are very, very deep. Uh, that's why this talk was subtitled A First Look at, at uh, Denotational Design. I really hope that that, uh, that y'all will sort of pick up the ball and, and run with it. So to review, denotational design, right, we can, we can sketch something out in Idris and then sort of translate to, to C++. Um, I have found this useful already just for stream, uh, trimming down APIs to their basics. Um, but there's, there's a lot more that you could do. Because in, in the address type system, you can prove not just that a vector has a certain length. You can prove that a list is always, that a portion of a list is always sorted. So if you're writing a sort routine, uh, you've, you've got like a sort of a loop invariant that has to be true every time through the sort loop that this subset, like if you're doing a, you know, God help you, a bubble sort, like that the subset <laughs> of the list is already sorted. Um, you can actually encode that in the address type system. Again, if, if, you're, if your sort routine doesn't correctly do that, or you know, if your quick sort partition routine doesn't work right, then uh, the type checker will catch it. So let's imagine we're going to write some big software package that can take audio clips and, and manipulate them. That's, that's our goal. And, and we've got some C++ APIs to, to deal with, right? So an audio clip in the computer is, of course, a series of sort of samples of the audio waveform over time. So if we're to do this, I've seen a lot of C++ APIs that sort of look like this. Oh, it's a bunch of samples. It's a collection of samples. OK, so we need to know how many samples are in the collection. All right? Seems fair. We need to be able to read and write samples from the collection. So here's our indexing operator. I can say audio clip bracket 5 or whatever, get the sixth uh, sample out. The, write ver the read version and the write version. OK. But uh, these are just you know, integers for the indexing and for the y values, what, what time values, what voltage values or loudness values do those go with? So now we need some scaling stuff, right? What's the, what's the time at my zeroth sample? What's the 
how many milliseconds or microseconds are in between each, each sample in the, in the waveform. And then we have to do the same thing for the vertical. What, what does a vertical value of 255 mean? You know, how, how many dB is that? And then, of course, we start to add a bunch of other stuff. Has anybody ever seen C++ or Java or C APIs grow like this, right? And uh, I, there's nothing super, super wrong with them. This is the person who wrote all this stuff probably tested it, and it probably works pretty well. But I get a little sad when an API gets really, really big like this. And now this class has a lot of jobs, right? And in Ruby, we talk about the single responsibility principle that we stole from you know, Smalltalk. But um, it kind of holds here. Now this class is being asked to do a lot. It's being asked to store data. It's being asked to maintain scaling information. It's being asked to maintain metadata uh, and to do I.O. Um, are, are you finding other holes in the class, too? I, I thought it was interesting that Ruby gets all of Right, that's, that's what I'm saying. We, we, we stole that from, right, from Smalltalk. So I don't think that you expanded the possessive equity. Oh, right, okay. You're right, it's, it's, it's like air, right? We're, we're all breathing the same air. You're, you're right. I, I, I didn't mean to suggest that Ruby owns SRP. Start talking about it. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, we finally grew up and started talking about it. Yes, and the, the rest of the programming language community is like, welcome, Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so class starts going like this, and I just like, wait a minute, time out. Let's let's start over. What, what's this thing supposed to do? So let's go back to like, what is an audio clip? And again, we 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 have been thinking about it in terms of how we've been representing it. It's it's a series of 16-bit integers, or or maybe 8-bit integers, and then like now we've got a bunch of special cases in our program. Well, if it's 16-bit, do this. If it's 8, do this. Um, what is an audio clip? It doesn't look like a bunch of discrete samples. It, it, it's continuous. An audio clip is sound changing continuously over time. So let's, let's sketch out that idea. So if you pop into Idris, let's just sort of sketch out a type. Um, an audio signal, an audio clip, is a function from time to loudness, and maybe we want to allow flexibility for 8-bit integers or 16-bit integers. Maybe we want to allow floating point numbers for the output and say, you know what, we'll just handle all the scaling internally. So now, whatever our loudness type is, audio is sort of a function from that type to a new, a, a new type. So you might have audio int or audio float or whatever. And so whatever that is, it takes the x-axis time, which is now continuous-ish, right? It's still I triple E floating point, but we like to pretend. We like to be a little delusional. And then the output, assu assuming that your sound clip is not infinitely long, then uh, there, there are points in time where there is no sound and points in time where there is sound. Uh, maybe you'll recognize from, from Haskell, right, as, as being the, uh, the way of getting around having to have null pointers or things like that because the compiler will, will make you check for them. So this seems a lot simpler. And it's, it's uh, translatable into, um, into C++. And there's another copy of that slide for some reason. So here's, here's kind of one way to do this in C++. You can, there should be a template class T above this. I will correct that before I post these. Um, so we have sort of a class audio of T, whether, again, whether T is an 8-bit or 16-bit integer or a floating point. Whatever it is, it kind of acts like a function. Right? The Idris version gives us a function from time to loudness. We can act function-like by implementing the, uh, the function call operator. It's not the only way to do this. It's a little cute, but that's OK. So we take a time, and we return whatever our loudness type is, maybe, and C++ it's not quite in the standard library, but it's in Boost, which is almost as good. We've got this optional type. Um, now, Boost optional is not quite as cool as maybe. Uh, did anybody go to the talk on Monads on Wednesday? I thought that was awesome. Please catch that if you didn't, uh, if you didn't make it. Uh, one of the things that the speaker pointed out was you, you wrap your data up in this little maybe type. Uh, but then you can kind of, you don't have to keep checking whether anything's in that box or not. 10 minutes, thank you. You don't have to keep checking whether anything's in that box or not. You can kind of construct functions that sort of thread that logic through for you automatically. And I love that you, you can do the same. You can't do all that fancy stuff with Boost Optional, but at the very least, you can, forget, you can prevent yourself from accidentally forgetting to check. There's a value there. So what can we do with some audio? Maybe we have a clip function that takes some audio and takes a starting and stopping time and, and gives us a new audio that's just a, a subset of that. 
So now we're, we're really getting to the essentials of what this stuff is. And nowhere in here do we have sample rates or spacing between points or any of this stuff. All that stuff presumably is internal. So instead of making our users deal with like scaling factors and doing all the multiplying and subtracting themselves, the user is doing the thing they care about. I want to take these two clips and overlay them or scoot them around in time. And we, we can give an API that does just that. And again, this is all translatable into C++ as well. We can have some type T. And we can have a clip that takes an audio of T and our start and stop times and returns a new audio of T. Uh, so this is all sort of hand wavy and speaking by analogy, but I actually have had good luck doing stuff like this to some of our, our types in C++ of saying, what's this thing really about? You don't have to use integers to do this. Um, the reason that the, the really hardcore academicians like to do this is because they can prove all sorts of things about their programs in Idris, but also, I find it useful mentally just to sort of cognitively step out of my C++ box and, and, and into a more expressive environment. And, but it's one that's close enough to C++ that I, I still have a hope of getting back. And, and as time goes on, I hope to be able to prove uh, more things about my types in interest before I bring them back over to C++. So the end game of all this, there is a fantastic talk that's, that's the next step after seeing my talk. There's, there's a talk by uh, David Senkel called The Intellectual Ascent to Agda. And uh, he does something similar, uh, but he's more explicit than I've been about when he's doing math on uh, meaning, like I mentioned earlier, versus math on uh, types. He's actually got a, a little notation for it, like mu sub t versus mu, like mu for meaning. And so he's, he's sort of very clear about which type he's doing his math on. It's much, much more detailed. Uh, and I, I don't know, I've, I've had to watch it like two or three times before it started to kind of percolate in. But y'all will get it right off the bat, I know. <laughs> so this is the next step here. I would, I would love for you to come and, and, and watch this on YouTube and then uh, hopefully begin to incorporate uh, some of these ideas into your own day-to-day -day work. Because no matter what your day-to-day your -day language is, I chose two that are fairly easy to kind of translate back and forth. But this idea of sketching in a, in a language that gives you something that your day-to-day -day language doesn't give you, I find really, really powerful. And that's what I really hope they all take away, that we can do math on meaning. And then now we get to, to go back out and do the sort of happy, warm feelings. I w wasn't even going to have a section on this, but I was on the train home yesterday, and I was finishing this book, uh, Born to Run, uh, which is about uh, how we evolved to become distance runners. And uh, it, it's, it's really fascinating. It shows some of the, the best runners from all over the world. And you, you have you know, your barefoot hipster runners and, and all this great stuff. And uh, you know, I, I like a little bit of long distance sports, of course. I've got to be nerdy about it and do, the, do it the race walking way um, instead of the running way. But he, was, he had this section on uh, how uh, Homo erectus learned to, to hunt when we didn't have the brains that the Neanderthals did and we didn't have the strength that the Neanderthals did. Uh, but what, what did we have is that we kept going, and, and like we ran, and, and we ran together. And I just love that, that phrase, uh, we ran like crazy and stuck together. I'm like, that, I was getting really like emotional and weepy in the train. This is what happens when you don't get enough sleep, right? And I'm like, <laughs> this is so open source, bridge, so it may not make much sense today. But, uh, <laughs> but this is the thing that just gave me a very open source bridge type feel. So, so let's, let's, uh, let's, let's build like hell, and let's stick together, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you all for coming. So.